Oh, yes, we're recording. This is good. So this means any of your friends who were not able to make it will be able to, to see and listen to the program at a later date. So, um, you know, this is the end of Women's History Month, which is celebrated in March every year. And even though I'm not um, a historian, a professor, a scholar, I am a concerned citizen like all of you with an intense interest in civil rights and justice, especially in terms of race, women, and gender equality, because it's just, it's just the right thing to do. Um, I, I'm gonna ask for a quick show of hands, who has heard of Pauli Mary? I'm gonna guess that perhaps those of you who are here have heard of her before. So I have two hopes for this program. Number one is that all of us will leave with the uh, intent of learning more about Polly Mary through the books that she wrote, the books written about her. There are, uh, there's a recent documentary that came out in 2021, which um, is called My Name is Polly Mary, and it is all about um, her life and legacy. It's a very well done um, documentary. And there's quite a few shorter uh, videos on YouTube that you can avail yourself of. Uh, and honestly, um, uh, because I'm not a, a scholar or historian, I hope that when we get to the uh, audience participation that those of you who do know more about Polly Mary will share what you know with the audience. I'm just sharing what I've learned over the last uh, couple of weeks. I've been doing my Polly Mary cramming. <laughs> um, and, and in fact, we can't really cover everything uh, that she's done in her life. I don't think even books and videos are enough to, to cover it. Let me ask a question here. Um, who in this room, and this is more in my field, my, uh, of my career, show of hands, who has heard of Ignatz Semmelweis? Last name Semmelweis. I see Marion's hand. Some people don't have their video on. Ignatz Semmelweis is another person like Pauli Mary who should be a household name. And in fact, I'm hoping that more and more uh, Pauli Mary will be a household name. But Ignaz Semmelweis uh, was a physician from Vienna, Austria, who in the 1880s or the 1800s, I should say, realized that women who were giving birth in the hospitals in the doctor's ward were dying at an um, incredibly high rate from what they called corporal fever or childbed fever. They were invariably getting um, septic infections and dying at an incredible rate. Whereas the women who delivered in the midwife ward largely did not have that complication. He discovered that hand washing with a type of lime solution, I don't remember the exact name of it, simple hand washing would prevent these infections. Um, the doctors at the time were going from whatever it was they were doing, including autopsies, they'd go straight from their other work to deliver babies and then back to other stuff. Nobody washed hands. This was only the mid 1800s. For his um, for his discovery of this, he was effectively mocked and laughed at into a, a nervous breakdown, and he passed away in a in a sanitarium. So, when we talk about Pauli Mary, um, you'll learn. I'm going to play a, a couple of short video clips and just you know tell you as much as I've learned as I can about her life. She endured a lot of suffering in her life. She grew up in poverty. She was orphaned at an early age. She grew up in the Jim Crow South 
in uh, born in Baltimore in 1910 and then uh, moved to Durham, North Carolina when she was about three or so. In addition to all that uh, gender discrimination and racial discrimination, she experienced what we call today gender dysmorphia. She always felt that she was a male in a female's body. And that's a big, big part of her story. Um, I myself have a vague recollection of hearing about Polly Mary sometime in the past, and I couldn't tell you when. But recently, um, Reverend Diane, who is on our committee, recommended a Netflix series you may have heard of called Amend, A-M-E-N-D, which is all about the 14th Amendment. Right. And one of the episodes uh, featured the work that Polly Murray did on uh, using the 14th Amendment as the basis for arguments that later led to overturning Plessy v. Ferguson, which was the separate but equal Supreme Court decision of 1898. And that was overturned with Brown versus the Board of Education, finally. But it was Polly Murray who laid out the argument probably 14 years before that, or 10 years before that, um, explaining that the 14th Amendment upheld the rights under the law of all persons, not specifically male or female, but all persons. So it was the, um, the work of Thurg um, Thurgood Marshall that helped win that case for Brown versus the Board of Education. She also um, used the 14th Amendment as the basis for a paper she wrote um, which Ruth Bader Ginsburg then later used for her first case uh, for promoting gender equality in a case um, in Idaho called Reed versus Reed. So um, our RBG, as we call uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, gave full credit to, to Polly Murray for initiating that. Um, Polly was, was a visionary. She saw things that the people, her contemporaries either dismissed or laughed at her or just plain um, ignored her. Um, she was a writer, a poet, a lawyer, an activist, a tenured professor, and towards the end of her life, she entered the, the priesthood in the Episcopal church. Um, I'm going to actually um, screen share this video now. So this is actually a part of um, a, a broadcast by Democracy Now!, which is, a, a, I don't know how you would describe it. It's a news program. And um, when the documentary my Name is Pauli Murray came out in 2021. Uh, Democracy Now! featured a, um, an interview with the people who made the documentary as well as um, people who could share stories about Pauli Murray. So I hope you can all see this screen mm -hmm. and I'm gonna play about eight minutes of this segment. This is Amy Goodman who hosts uh, Democracy Now! And you'll hear the voice of Polly Mary herself. RBG is also featured in My Name is Polly Murray. So, Julie Cohen, if you can take us back, I mean, what is astounding about this, and I'm sure for many around the world who are watching or listening to this or reading about it right now, is this is the first time they are hearing Polly Murray's name. Yet, named uh, by RBG as one of her inspirations, and then go back in time to Thurgood Marshall, and before that as well. That, yeah, that's right. Um, I mean, certainly there is a growing awareness among uh, progressives in the U.S., um, Episcopal, Episcopals, people who live in Durham, North Carolina, you know, uh, uh, pockets of, of extreme interest and academics who are interested in Pauli Murray. But the fact is, most of us 
Uh, we're not taught about Pauli Murray in our elementary school history classes, as perhaps we should have been, or, or later in, in our schooling. And yet, this is a person who influenced so many different movements in the U.S., not only, as you were talking about, the fight for gender equality, but also the fight for racial equality. When Pauli Murray was at Howard Law School in the early 1940s, Pauli wrote a paper uh, making the argument that Plessy versus Ferguson should be overturned, uh, that 1896, the notorious 1896 Supreme Court case uh, laying down the rule of separate but equal. Um, the feeling of the early civil rights movement at that point was what we should be fighting for in the separate but equal realm is to sort of you know, improve the conditions in segregated institutions. Pauli Murray's argument was, no, no, no. This whole construct is faulty. Separate but equal, by definition, is unfair. And by keeping people separate, you are treating them unequally. You're creating a, a stamp or a badge of inferiority, tell, telling people that you, you have to, you know, people need to go into their own corners. Uh, Pauli's uh, t teachers and uh, classmates at Howard Law School thought this idea too, too radical. In Pauli's description, um, there was laughter and mocking. Um, Pauli said, I think that Plessy is going to be overturned. Uh, I think within 25 years was Pauli's guess. Uh, one of her, one of Polly's professors um, <coughs> made, a, made a $10 wager saying, like, no, absolutely no way. Of course, 10 years later, 1954, uh, the Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court ruling came out saying exactly that. Separate but equal is unconstitutional. Um, and Pauli's law professors had been invo were, were involved in that case. Uh, Spotswood Robinson, who was Pauli's professor at Howard, uh, Thurgood Marshall, also teaching at Howard, like all the great civil rights, uh, you know, I icons were very much circling around Howard University. And in fact, Pauli's paper was used in developing the arguments that <laughs> went into the Brown versus Board of Education brief. There's sort of specific points that Pauli makes that actually find their way into the formal brief and then into the Supreme Court ruling. I want to turn to an audio clip of Pauli Murray speaking in 1966 at the Harvard Law Forum. Nature does not ask us where she distributes brains, intellect, talent, drive. She simply scatters these with the recombination of the genes. Uh, in some ways, I might have been disadvantaged to have been born a Negro in white America, a woman in a man's profession, left-handed in a right-handed world. And I might throw in even an orphan at an early age. But there were, certain this, there were certain advantages in this status, which I didn't see then, but I see in retrospect. I therefore came to sex discrimination much later than I came to race discrimination. And having fought the battle of race discrimination, I began to see how integrally these two discriminations were. Since I could not split myself, and since I had to be a unified human being, I decided that it was not I that was wrong, but the society that was wrong. And that any time a society penalizes an individual because of a biological attribute, whether it be race per se, or whether it be sex per se, that society is going to be challenged. So that was Pauli Murray speaking at a Harvard Law Forum. Pauli Murray went to Howard Law School. Uh, in the 40s, Pauli Murray wrote a letter to Harvard Law School after being rejected for a further degree. At the time, the school only accepted men. Pauli wrote, quote, I would gladly change my sex to meet your requirements, but since the way to such change has not been revealed to me, I have no recourse but to appeal to you to change your minds. Now, 
This is not a minor point. She is prevented from going to Harvard Law School because of um, uh, they said they would not accept women to Harvard Law School. She would go to the University of California, Berkeley, then get another degree at Yale. Now a building is named uh, for Pauli Murray, the first African American uh, named on a building. A building is named for um, Betsy West. If you could talk about. A lot of what's embedded in what she's and what Pauli Murray is saying. Now, Pauli Murray at the time referred to herself as she, um, but this is at a time when she had asked for testosterone treatment. Um, when um, they had asked for testosterone treatment, um, when they were asking doctors, could it be that in fact I am male? Uh, when there was an appendix problem, begging the doctor to do exploratory surgery to see if perhaps um, they had male genitalia inside. Yeah, um, as you said, uh, this was a this was a struggle that Polly went through privately. <clears throat> um, you know, Polly wrote about civil rights women's rights, her fight for those things. But at the same time, as a young woman, Polly was experiencing the feelings, hey, I'm a man. And in, in Polly's 30s and 40s, consulting a series of doctors, uh, it was really extraordinary to read the letters that are in the Plessinger Library at Harvard, where Polly's archive resides. Uh, in a folder that Polly saved for posterity to read, uh, her struggle to find an answer to the feelings that, that Polly had at the time. I mean, you have to remember, in the 1930s and 1940s, uh, there were no—there was no language. There were no words to describe the feelings that Polly had had from the time that she was a little girl. Um, and something that, uh, you know, was, a, was a, a private struggle that now, thanks to her saving all of this, we know about. And I think, um, you know, many people in the trans community will hear about have, have identified uh, with very strongly. We talk So friends, I'm going to move forward to the next uh, part of the video. I wanna show you where Bishop Michael Curry will talk more. He was, he's an Episcopal Bishop and he's gonna tell us um, everything, <laughs> almost everything I think we would like to know about Holy Mary. Influence landmark civil rights decisions and gender equality legislation that transformed our world. Late in life, after being a tenured professor at Brandeis University, Pauli Murray became a priest in the Episcopal Church, now considered a saint. This is Episcopal Bishop Michael Curry speaking about Murray's legacy and the fight for civil rights. Long before, almost 10 years before, Rosa Parks sat down and refused to give up her seat on that bus in Montgomery, Alabama. Polly Murray sat down on a bus and refused to give up her seat, refusing to sit in the segregated section. She anticipated movements that would come years later. She sowed the seeds for change that would eventually happen. It was Pauli Murray who produced the seminal study of segregation laws throughout the United States that formed much of the basis for the legal work of Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP Legal Defense Fund that went into the case of Brown versus Board of Education. Pauli Murray did most of that legal research on civil rights, on segregation laws that needed to be overturned. That was Pauli Murray. She anticipated change that would impact both civil rights, but women's rights, 
and eventually LGBTQ rights. She anticipated all of those things in her legal work, in her legal writings. Her friendship with the late Eleanor Roosevelt was a friendship that was built on a mutual commitment to values of a humane and a decent world. She worked assiduously for that kind of world, even though she herself did not actually see it. She wrote and worked for the equality of women and for equity. In fact, there's a new uh, uh, commentary, a new article I saw the other day that has Ruth Bader Ginsburg referring to Pauli Murray as one of her heroines, if you will, in the struggle and in the work. She's an unsung hero for the rights and the equity of women, an unsung hero for the rights and the equality and equity of all people in this country an unsung hero for the rights of LGBTQ people in this country. She anticipated it. She saw it before it happened, and she worked for something that she would never see, but she did it so that some of us might actually see it. I don't know what to say after that, <laughs> but I'm going to. A couple of things you saw when they played the audio of um, uh, Polly Mary addressing Harvard. And then we learned she was rejected by Harvard Law School when she applied. And she, of course, did um, get to go to Howard University. And it was there when she went to Howard University Law School that she encountered what she called, what she ended up calling Jane Crow. Because for most of her first year there, she was practically not allowed to speak or was virtually ignored. There was, I think there was two other women in the class, but eventually she was the lone woman who finished law school at Howard, at, with her class in Howard University. But because, she was uh, so ignored there, she made it her business to rise to the top of the class by the time of graduation. She, uh, by the second year, everyone was listening to her. And it was at, law, at Har Howard uh, where they mentioned one of her professors made a bet with her. She said, Plessy B. Ferguson will be, be overturned in under 25 years and he said, I don't think so. You want to bet? And they bet $10 and she won because the paper she wrote was in the 1940s and by 1954, it had been overturned. You also heard mention of her refusal to give up a bus seat in 1940 in Virginia. We can imagine there were countless people who rejected and fought back against that type of segregation in the South. I'm sure there were people who were arrested that we never heard of, but in, in this particular case, she was, it was not uh, what we call, it was not prearranged. She was traveling from North down to North Carolina, back down South. And the tradition on public transportation was that once you crossed the line into the segregated states, you had to change your seat. Sometimes you had to change the car you were on in a train or go to the back of the bus. And for a number of reasons, she and the person she was traveling with said, oh no, no, we're not. They ended up getting arrested. The case did go to court and the NAACP in the area got involved, but the judge, apparent, it sounds like the judge could see that this was not a case that he wanted to push forward on the basis of segregation. So they ended up kind of dismissing that charge and convicting her of disturbing the peace. So as we know, it was, uh, it wasn't until the 1950s when the, um, the NAACP and um, under the leadership of Martin Luther King in Alabama, in Montgomery, 
I'm sorry, was it Montgomery or Birmingham? It was Montgomery. And um, they, they planned ahead of time, they strategized, they engaged the entire community. But we, it, Polly Mary understood this well ahead of her time, as did many people. She understood the value of nonviolent civil resistance. She had read the work of uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Um, the methods he endorsed were actually called Satyagraha, the nonviolent tactics. There was another episode when she was at Howard University. In 1943, she spearheaded the successful integration of a restaurant in Washington, DC. So what was interesting about that is there were much of Washington DC was segregated, but it was not the law, it was the custom. So there was a restaurant in a largely black neighborhood that never would serve black people, they only served white people. So she and a bunch of students, this time they did strategize, they made a plan. They went into the restaurant in a small group, three or four. They asked to be served. I'm sorry, we do not serve you. So they said, okay. And they went and sat at tables, opened up their books and studied. And then another small group, and then another small group until they filled the place up. And I don't remember all the details of the story, but eventually they had to cave because they had no legal basis for not serving the black people who lived there. And it was completely um, just civil resistance and a nonviolent protest that they were successful at. And this was then 1943, which was well before the well and better known uh, sit-ins at Woolworths in North Carolina and elsewhere. Um, so going back to Jim Crow, it was in 1944, she wrote an article with that title. I'm sorry, she called it Jane Crow. And it was actually a satirical article that she wrote for a magazine called The Sentinel, which was the largest African-American newspaper on the West Coast, talking about the double discrimination that black women face. So it's not bad enough to be discriminated based on race, but also based on being female. So she wrote this 20 years before the ACLU even began to fight on that issue of equal protection. She actually later served on the ACLU board. And as you also heard, she was a key figure in the transgender rights movement that we see today. They mentioned in one of the videos that she actively sought testosterone treatment. At the time, there was no real language for what she was experiencing internally. She always felt that she was a male. When she was a child and orphaned, her aunt Pauline raised her. And at the age of eight, they went clothes shopping and Polly says, I don't want dresses. I don't want girl clothes. So her aunt Pauline let her buy boy clothes. She was very uh, accepting of Polly for just the person that she was. She let her wear boy clothes all week, except for church on Sunday. She said, I'm sorry, you're wearing a dress. <laughs> but um that love and acceptance was um, a vital part of um, shaping Polly's character. So I find it personally ironic that we honor her as a champion for women's rights when she largely did not identify as a woman, except that was her external uh, persona. And that these trials and tribulations, I, I think she often felt uh, propelled her forward. She used them to her advantage. She um, actually sought out lots of medical advice on this issue and never 
actually found a doctor who was willing to give her testosterone, even though mm -hmm. it was available for men who wanted more masculine attributes. She struggled with um, chronic depression and anxiety. She was hospitalized frequently for um, breakdowns and exhaustion. Um, but back to back to um, the the rest of uh, part of her story. Like I said, there's far too much to uh, cover in a short um, episode like this, a short program. But I, I did want to just you know tell you a little bit more. You know, she did have um, uh, the opportunity to go to, to Ghana, Africa. And it was actually after a lynching that occurred in Poplarville, Mississippi in 1959, a man called Mac Parker. And every lynching was, was horrible and terrorizing to people. But for some reason, um, this, this just hit her right between the eyes and she couldn't, she just couldn't um, bear anymore to live in a country where this was continuing to happen. She accepted a position teaching uh, law at a newly formed school in Ghana, Africa, which had just uh, become independent two years previous. So I'm sure initially she thought this was be a wonderful opportunity for the newly independent country to set their own destiny. But within 18 months, she was effectively um, intimidated out of the country. It, the leadership actually was turning into a dictatorship. Um, she was on the radar, so to speak, for bringing her American ideas. In addition, um, at that time, she had already applied to Yale Law School and they accepted her. So after 18 months in Ghana, she came back to the state, she went to Yale Law School, she got her doctorate. One of the 14 residential colleges at Yale is now named Holy Mary College. And then after that, she went to be a professor at Brandeis University but after only two years at Brandeis, her longtime companion, Irene Barlow, died at the, in 1973. They were together for 15 years. So this was one more heartbreak that um, caused Pauli to, at that point later in her life, to turn towards spirituality. And that was when she left law and uh, to, went to the seminary to become a priest in the Episcopal Church. And she was the first black woman to be ordained as an Episcopal priest. And I, honestly, I think you could have a, as, a list as long as your arm of Holy Mary being the first of this, the first of that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it really goes on and on. Um, I would love it if we could um, open up to comments and questions. Um, and please, like I said, um, I'd love people to share what they know about Pauli Mary. Please go ahead and turn on your cameras. Mm -hmm. I have some questions um, that we could ponder. Um, in the face of adversity, what causes some to fail and others to overcome? We can see Pauli overcome a lot. What should be the response of the individual or the community to injustice? What do we owe to our community? What does our community owe to us? And how do our perspectives shape or alter the way we, we each perceive truth? When is it necessary to question the status quo? How can literature serve as a vehicle for social change? How does conflict influence an individual's decisions and actions? And perhaps, anyone in this room has their own stories of discrimination to share. So um, let's please open it up. Um, you can 
it looks like we haven't filled up the whole screen. If you want to raise your hand electronically or just unmute yourself, we're a small enough group. Okay, I see Linda Oppenheim has raised her hand. Hi, I'm sorry, I'm on twice. I tried, I was driving and I tried to get into my phone first. So that's somehow still hanging that's around. Okay. Thank you. I, I just want to, uh, and thank you very much for such an informative program about somebody I've been really wanting to learn more about and just haven't gotten myself to the information. So you presented it so beautifully. Uh, mm. But one thing that really struck me in her comments at Harvard was that essentially she was describing intersectionality. That word hadn't been coined, but she clearly was talking about that. Another kind of precedent that she was setting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're right. So many things that she did, there were no words for. There was no terminology because mm. people hadn't conceived of them even. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah, you. I like the way she worded it. And she said, well, since I can't change myself, perhaps I can change your mind. Your mind. Yeah. Right. And I know that she was the first African-American um, to graduate from the uh, Yale School of Law. That was That's wonderful. right. Thank you. I mm. see, Al, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, you said what you were, um, what you knew about her, you know, came about in the last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, how does she come uh onto your radar well i i believe i've heard of her in the past but just went over my head i was watching the um the series uh reverend diane recommended called amend and it's uh it's on netflix it's a six-part series and it's about the 14th amendment and they did a good part of one of the episodes was all about Pauli Murray and her work. And I, I said, what? <laughs> so um, then I looked her up. I saw a couple of YouTube videos and um, we needed a program for Women's History Month. And I said, it has to be Pauli Murray. Yeah. So I Perfect. have two kids who, um, who have degrees from Howard University and they never mentioned her. Yeah. I, so I have to ask them if they, you know, mm -hmm. uh, if they, if she had been on their radar at any point in their, you know, uh, scholarly career there. Mm. Uh, I, I, I also think Ruth Bader Ginsburg, because she was quite a hero to her, brought attention to Pauli Murray. Um, I think she was one of the first people from, you know, that I learned of. Mm -hmm. Very inspirational. Marion has her hand up. Uh, yeah, I'm just curious. Uh, it was a few years ago I heard about Polly Murray, but I'm curious about how she and Eleanor Roosevelt met and what that connection was, Patty. Oh, yeah, I, I read a little bit and I haven't finished reading. So um, anyway, um, in 1938, Lor Lor um Pauli applied to the University of North Carolina, a law school, and they were just flat out, I'm sorry, we don't accept colored people, which was the terminology. And she was like, she, she knew very well that they didn't accept it. She actually made her rejection public and it got into the newspapers and so on. She appealed directly, she wrote a letter to President Roosevelt and knowing that he either would never read it or might dismiss it because, of course, he's the president. He's got things to do. She copied Eleanor Roosevelt on mm. the letter. Eleanor did respond. And that was the beginning of a long, close friendship. Eleanor supported her in things that other people ignored. When mm. her own family couldn't be present for one of her graduations, Eleanor sent flowers. It was a, it was a genuine close relationship. And mm. Eleanor, in fact, at least one time, uh, kind of, you know, wrote to Paulie and said, you know what you said in this letter or whatever it was, I don't remember the details. She's like, I'm not sure you were quite right. You maybe could have been a little more, um, a little gentler, less strident, et cetera. Paulie was, um, was 
often um, a little unrestrained. I think she was always polite, but what was on her mind was what she said. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, Eleanor was a big fan of polling. Barbara Withers has indicated um, in the chat, she put uh, the title of a book about the two of them, The Firebrand and the First Lady. Um, it's by P Patricia Bell Scott, and it's about Polly and Eleanor Roosevelt. Oh, thank you for so that. That's in the chat, sure. And then um, there are other um, books and videos in the chat um, for everyone's information. Yeah, I'm currently reading a book called <clears throat> Jane Crow, which is a, a biography of Polly Mary. And then Polly Mary herself wrote her own family history called Proud Shoes. Mm -hmm. And then her own autobiography, Song and a Weary Throat. So I guess those are going to be on my list of things to read. Yeah, she wrote some beautiful poetry to, in those books. Mm -hmm. Some beautiful poetry. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, somebody turned me on to Proud Shoes about four years ago, and she lives in North Carolina, and it was a part of the book club discussion. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. when I first read it. And it is a very, very interesting book. Um, historically speaking and talking about her heritage and her family. Um, so I would definitely recommend, you know, Thank picking you. up that, that copy. Uh -huh. Thank you. There's, um, there's another um, short little video of uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg that I would like to show. It's just the four minutes. It's a little interview that um, they did with her where she credits uh, Polly Mary uh, and describes what she knows about her. So I'm gonna share that now. Did you see the picture of Polly Murray's class at Howard <laughs> with a lone woman? When did I first become aware of Pauli Murray? In the summer of 1958. I was engaged as a summer associate in a law firm, and I was taken to meet the lone woman associate, Pauli Murray. I thought she was remarkable. She had written the book about her family, Proud Shoes, and I had read that, so I knew a little bit about Pauli. My closest affiliation with her was when she was on the board of the ACLU. I saw her working at her office in Paul Weiss, but that was just fleeting as I was going down the corridor. The 14th Amendment contains my favorite clause of the Constitution, nor shall any state deny any person the equal protection of the laws. Pauli had the idea that we should interpret the text literally. It said any person, not any male person. She wrote this remarkable article called Jane Crow and the Law, where she called attention to all the laws that restricted what women could do. But unlike race discrimination, they were all rationalized as favors for the ladies. For example, women were not permitted to serve on juries. It was thought that would distract them from their responsibility at home. The idea of Jane Crow was to show that classifications dividing the world up that way were not benign. They did not operate benignly in women's favor. Years later, Justice Brennan put it very well. He said, the pedestal on which women were thought to stand, more often than not, turns out to be a cage. <laughs> Read Me Read was the turning point gender discrimination case in the Supreme Court. Section number four, read against read. Sally Reed's case was ideal to open the court's eyes. The case on the facts was heartrending. The law was as arbitrary as it could be. 
males must be preferred to females. The actual wording of the 14th Amendment is very simple. The case itself presents a large and I think significant problem. I wrote the brief in Sally Reed's case. I put on the cover Paulie Murray's name. By the time of Reed, Paulie had already changed her interest. She was going to divinity school. She was into ministry, not lawyering. But we knew when we were writing that brief that we were standing on her shoulders because she was the one that sparked the idea that the 14th Amendment should protect the right of men and women, boys and girls, should let them be free to be you and me. That is to follow their talent as far as it could take them. Unlike Paulie, who was way ahead of her time, I was there at the right time. We owed so much to her courage, to her willingness to speak out when society was not prepared to listen. That's a great phrase. Society was not prepared to listen. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Patty. Are there any other questions, comments? Mr. James, did you have a question? No. Oh, okay. I see Eileen's hand. Um, Eileen Tyson. Hi. Um, I was thinking about how everything that she was, she was being told that she shouldn't, that she couldn't be what she wanted to be, you know? And um, we know that depression and mental illness comes from many causes. Um, mm -hmm. But you got to think of the fact that, you know, at every turn, she was told she was not the right gender, she was not the right color, she was not the right person, you know, that that absolutely had to have um, a crushing impact on her spirit. Everything that's in the dryer, in the washer, should have went in the dryer, okay? Close it. Mute yourself, please. Really? Yes, yeah, someone's speaking. Can you please mute yourself? Um, I just, I just muted her. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Eileen. No, no, I think I was finished. Uh, just admiring how a woman who was so clearly not fitting in to that time period still believed in who she was and what she could accomplish. It's, it's amazing, really. And to be so brilliant. Yes, yes. It took incredible strength on her part yeah. at that particular time. I think that, that video other... was so powerful, the fact that Ruth um, um, is the one who acknowledged that she stood on her shoulders and that, that she was the person who, um, like when she wrote her own, uh, whatever you call it, to, to go against the discrimination, it was based on work that, um, that Pauli had done. And I think that's a powerful statement. Very powerful. Mm -hmm. Consider, considering so, she was so powerful. Yeah, exactly. First question. Next. Yes, Mr. James. Based on all that we just learned, um, who can explain why she isn't more prominent in our history. I mean, you would think that, uh, you know, that she would be better known than, uh, you know, than, than say Ruth Bader Ginsburg and so many others, but she's not known. I think as Ginsburg said, she was ahead of her time and we're only really recognizing people from the 60s doing the prominent civil rights era. But I mean, it's an excellent point. I mean, my, I agree with you. I really do agree with you, but I guess we just forget about the people who who did the same things, you know, decades before right. the civil rights era. So you hear yeah, a I, lot about Thurgood Marshall as far as Brown uh, uh, and Board of yeah. Education is concerned, yeah. but, you know, what her contribution wasn't, uh, uh, doesn't seem to have been there. See? Yeah, and I think I read earlier, they said that, um, Thurgood Marshall himself called 
Murray's 1950 book, State's Law on Race and Color, the Bible of the Civil Rights Mo Movement. Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah, I was going to say, um, uh, Bishop uh, Curry mentioned that she did the study of U.S. segregation laws. So she put together, uh, she researched all the segregation laws in every state in the union and compiled it. Originally, the manuscript, they said, was a foot high wow. Wow. of everything all around the country. And yeah, that, I, that is what uh, Thurgood Marshall was referring to. Nobody had put it all together until wow. she did it. <laughs> so another first well, thing. I, I think it was the time period, too, that women weren't listened to. Right. She wasn't allowed in to go to to go to these colleges. She wasn't gone. And who writes the history? It's mm -hmm. men were writing the history. Oh, that's now women point. are finally writing the history. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did I see another hand up? I mean I mean again. again. Yes. You know, I, I wonder also if the fact that she was transgender or you know had gender issues. I wonder if that just seemed like a bridge too far for people of her generation. You know, like people were willing to mm -hmm. uh, struggle with, you know, racial discrimination and discrimination about against women. I have no this, idea of trans. Like, yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I wonder if that yeah. might be the lack of uh, mention that she gets. You know, um, I- well, There um, was no knowledge took, about it at that point either too, so. She took great pains to um, <clears throat> to not disclose that openly to people, but that's not to say that people didn't pick up on things. In fact, um, <clears throat> there were uh, there was the one time um, for some months over a summer, she and a, a female friend hitchhiked back and forth across the country. And the whole time, Holly was dressed as a boy. So to outward appearances, people just thought she was a he. And um, I think they got picked up for something one time. And she was probably on the verge of getting in trouble for it. And they kind of blew it off as a prank, because the girls, because they, you know, they were teenagers and like, oh, we're just kidding around. But she, understood very well um, what repercussions, I mean, bad enough, she was a woman and she was black, but right. to then add on this uh, gender issue that people couldn't conceive of it at all. And e even now, um, so many folks are, tr are doing their best to um, uh, show accommodations to people with transgender issues um that doesn't mean we all understand it but at least we can have a conversation and back then yeah but but why i mean to answer your question al i don't know why uh, it reminds me of um how the legacy and the work of t thomas fortune was largely lost to history until um you know, we discovered he was here in Red Bank and everything else that he did, but really how many other people have heard of him? Right. right. So many people. Patty, hmm. um, you talk about her depression and, you know, a lot of her troubles in her early life. Would you like to just tell us a little bit about what happened to her mother and father when she was younger? So, um, her mother died at the age when Polly was only three. Mm -hmm. um, and soon oh, after sad. that, her father uh, ended up in a psychiatric facility. And he was only there for a couple of years when he died. Um, he was beaten to death there. By a um, guard. Yeah. So wow. it, it's completely tragic. tragic. There were, um, I'm trying to remember, I think there was five or six other siblings. So she was raised by her aunt Pauline and the other siblings went to other relatives. Um, she didn't see them that much except on occasion. I don't remember all the details. I mean, there's so many, many stories that um, 
I can't remember all of them, but really um, what's interesting is that no matter what happened, I mean, she could just, she just could see straight through what was happening. If somebody was treating her badly, um, she understood what was happening. If she was given uh, poor accommodations, she's like, nope, nope, this isn't happening. And uh, for example, when she went to Ghana, they put her in a, um, a, a place that was ramshackle. It was full of bugs. It was this and that. They finally um, gave her the place that they were intending to build, but it was also poorly, you know, the, sh the work was shoddy. She had to insist that it be redone, things like that. Um, she just always knew what was right and didn't back down. Yeah, didn't back down. And fought for everything. Mm -hmm. uh, it's my understanding she taught herself how to read by the age of five and that she That's graduated right. from high school at 15. I mean, when mm -hmm. you look at her background, I believe there were six children, um, but you know, from the very beginning, she was determined to you know, live her life to the fullest and educate herself to the very best of her ability. And it was yeah. all self-initiated. There was nobody really supporting her. It was all done, you know, on her own, yeah. despite the odds. Her her aunt Pauline supported her, yeah, and and other relatives. But yes, it was her own initiative and work, right? Yeah. Marion has her hand up as well. I, I I just thought she um she seems to me to be the epitome of when you read about resilient children who, under very terrible circumstances, that um uh, that go ahead and thrive somehow or find a purpose in their lives. And I would say she's a great example and we should be making sure our children and grandchildren learn about her, but she is a great mm -hmm. example, I think, of somebody who was resilient in the face yeah. of um, incredible odds. And I'd heard of her before, but I thank you for what we've learned tonight. I really appreciate it. Thank you all for coming. and. You know, I as as much as she went through, she really dedicated her life to changing circumstances so others would not have to go through all of that. Because some people don't do as well. Absolutely. And she suffered a lot. She, um, you know, medically, it was also uh, later in life that she was diagnosed with a form of hyperthyroidism, there was a growth on her thyroid, mm -hmm. which um, accounted probably for a lot of symptoms, not, not her gender dysmorphia, but certainly um, anxiety, depression, and other physical uh, manifestations. And she did feel somewhat better after the surgery for that. Okay. Um, but yeah, but the, the psychic suffering, the toll it is very high, very high. Mm -hmm. And she laid the groundwork so much too for, um, you know, some of the acceptance and openness and, and, and what society has, you know, changed and accepted for people today. Mm -hmm. um, she just really, and there's so many people that, that looked up to her. There were a couple of people in the video. I watched the whole thing, uh, the other social worker and, and, some other people were really, really so inspired with meeting her and working with her as well. Mm -hmm. um, a question was raised, um, when did she pass away? You know uh, she passed away in 1985. I don't know um, the story um, of what happened at the end of her life. Okay. If anyone there, if anyone else knows, I'm, I'm reading um, two thirds of the way through the book. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So yeah, I mean, it wasn't that long ago, 1985. Yeah, she was born in 1910. She lived to age 75. And I, I just hope that um, you know she will become um, more of a household name. That people, you know, the people, many people have been giving her the credit she deserves. 
but it, it was all, it all seems to be after the fact. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's the case with many, many people. Patty, did you know if she, um, does the book indicate or does anyone else know if she had other close family members near her toward the end of her life? Um, Oh, because towards the end, I don't know. I know Brooklyn. that um, she lived in Brooklyn for a while. Um, wow. She tried staying down south uh, often, but it was too much for her. Mm -hmm. uh, she was in Brooklyn and had an apartment with her, I think two of her aunts and one of her nephews. Um, what's also interesting is when she was young, maybe 20 or so, she actually married a young man and it sounded like the marriage lasted about a weekend <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. she's like i don't think so <laughs> but they never uh divorced until many years later i can't remember what the circumstance was um they're like oh did we forget to get divorced anyway she had to track him down and uh, <laughs> I thought that was interesting, but um, yeah, she tried to do things for her um, nephews when and uh, aunts whenever she could. Mm -hmm. but, but they predeceased her; at the aunts did, of course. Mm -hmm. I don't know who was near her when she passed. Okay. Okay. Um, I mean, she was always fighting for social justice and. Uh, one thing I just want to leave everyone with tonight before we do leave is what role do each of us play um, in protecting the human rights of others? I mean, she identified really as a male, but look at everything that she did for women. I mean, she mm -hmm. tried to do things for everyone. And despite the time now and the fact that we get sometimes depressed about how things are a good thing is 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 that people like Polly are being brought to the attention of the public today and you know we're able to educate ourselves on all the things that she did very true so if you get the chance uh, to see that documentary um my right. name is Polly Mary it's amazing there's other shorter videos on YouTube. There's books. Um, yeah, it's, I, I hope we haven't heard the end of it. And and watch um, the other series, Amend, on Netflix. Netflix. It's very educational in, in every aspect. Um, Christine is asking, is the Ginsburg clip easy to find on YouTube? Uh, I don't know how easy it is to find. Uh, somebody, actually Walter Grayson sent it to me. But if you go on YouTube, look under RBG wanted people to know more about one of, what is it? I can't read the whole title. <laughs> one of history's something. So it begins RBG wanted people to know. So, um, Time Magazine put that out um, uh, in honor of Pauli Mary some time ago. Mm. Okay. I guess. Yes, uh, Mr. Uh, I guess most people are not. Uh, I guess what you would call activists. So I think her defiance in terms of changing her seat and the, what happened with the restaurant and in um washington i mean most people just don't do that <laughs> uh unfortunately because it would probably help if you had a lot of people do it but most of them don't come out that way they'll you know i guess follow the roles dictated and therefore the the change that you might you know look for just mm -hmm. doesn't come about as quickly as uh, as it might that's right mm -hmm. Well, that's why a lot of the people that actually do go forward with this are are kind of standouts in history. Yeah. And um, and as Linda said, hopefully her name will will not be forgotten. And that well, you've she'll all be... heard it now, <laughs> right? It's, it's, I just it's... wanted to add. Yes, Barbara. Uh, uh, 
Patricia Bell Scott, who wrote The Firebrand and the First Lady. She wow. did take about 20 years to write that book, but mm -hmm. she was one of the consulting producers on the film. My mm -hmm. name is Pauli Murray. Okay. So, uh, so there's a lot of history. And, and if you look up Patricia Bell Scott on her mm -hmm. website, you can find a lot of interesting history related to this subject also. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara. Thank you. So I well, guess it's she, up to us to help spread the word. Oh, right. I yes. say, she must have known, I mean, because Eleanor herself was, you know, I guess quite a trailblazer in, in, uh, in that fashion. So she must have known, you know, something about it to make sure that she got a copy of that letter. Yeah, uh, she wrote to the president. Right. <laughs> he was amazing. Right, right. The two of them together, yes. Yeah, two very different personalities uh, that really work together to yeah. get some things done. <laughs> it was amazing. And then a lot of similarities as well. Yes. Right. Right, right. We want to thank you, Patty, so much for this great presentation. Oh, thank you all for coming. This is a wonderful opportunity. I appreciate all of you. And um, we do have, we will be back in April. We don't know what the program is yet, right, Linda? But it'll be uh, April yeah. 26th, the last Correct. Wednesday. Last Wednesday, always. And we always appreciate everybody coming. Please look to see what the next program is. If you have any ideas or you'd like to help present a program, we'd really like to have you email. You can mm -hmm. email me, Patty, Claire. Um, just let us know. Uh, oftentimes it's easy to come up with ideas, but to execute the programs, especially monthly, yeah. is full-time occupation. So, especially when you've been doing it for eight years. So, just amazing. Well, thank you so much. Um, we've gotten a lot of good feedback in the chat. Thank you all for coming. This was a great program tonight as well. And we I hope to see everyone you. next month. Okay. We'll thank you for having thank us. Thank okay. You. Thank you, friends. Thanks for coming. Good night. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye. We got that recorded. So I'll close the meeting then. Okay. okay. I can close it, uh, Patty. I was just waiting. Oh, okay. Right. Thank you guys so much. Thank Thanks you. Thank coming. you. Patty, You're welcome. Thank you very, very much. Great <laughs> Thanks, job. Thanks, Patty. It was Thanks. very good. Thanks. Oh, good. Thank you. Take care. Feel better, Linda. Yes, Thanks. please, please oh, do. See you tomorrow. Yeah. Yes. Bye. Bye, guys. Okay. Bye. Bye.